got your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Um, before I get into the Word, I did want to let you know of two other things that are happening, uh, a couple of important things that are happening that were, were not on our announcements, uh, but I want to go ahead and give these to you. Next Saturday at 5 o'clock, October the 16th, uh, at 5 o'clock, there is a community worship and prayer time at the depot in Cornelia. Uh, I'm going to be a part of uh, praying. There's several pastors that are coming together. We've done this on numerous occasions, and uh, I'm not heading this up or leading this up. I'm just a part of a, another group of pastors locally here uh, that just want to unify and work together. How many of the churches, we need to work together? Instead of against each other, we need to work together. And so uh, it's going to be next Saturday, October the 16th at 5 o'clock, uh, and it's going to be at the depot. I'll be there. I'll be leading a segment. They've asked me to pray for revival, so that's the topic they've asked me to pray for. Uh, there'll be some worship there, and we'd love for you to come out. Usually it lasts an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and uh, it's just a great time for the community to come together. So I wanted to let you know that. Also, I think I did mention this several weeks ago. Our men's event is coming up, and it's going to be on Friday. Friday, November the 12th. I wanted to go ahead and give you this because we're about four weeks out or so or somewhere around there. Uh, Friday, November the 12th at 7 o'clock right here at the church. Uh, it, 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 we will gather together for our men's event. Uh, I shared with you uh, before that we have an issue in our society today. It's not only with men. Uh, the statistics say it's with women as well. And as a pastor, uh, a lot of times in counseling and talking to people, uh, we know that we even see it sometimes. Your children have probably been affected by it. I was affected by it even as a child. And it's even more readily and easily available today than ever before, and that's this thing called pornography. And a lot of times we don't like to talk about pornography in the church. It makes people uncomfortable and all these uh, type of things. But as a, as a minister and as a, as a pastor, as someone that has been set free from it for many, many years, back when I was, uh, before I went into ministry training school, uh, got set free from the addiction of pornography, of someone who had struggled with it, even in my own personal life. The one thing that I see a lot, especially in our society today, is that it has plagued families, it has plagued men. And it has caused people to live in guilt, shame, and condemnation. It has torn marriages apart. It has opened the door a lot of times that people don't realize this, that it opens the door to the enemy to come in uh, and, and to wreak havoc, to kill, steal, and destroy. And so several years ago, we did something very controversial. Uh, when you talk about it in the church world, we did a Saturday morning breakfast, and we called it porn and pancakes. How many was here? for that. And people were like, what are y'all doing? That church over there, this and that and everything else. But we came together, we had pancakes, and we dealt with this topic in a way that's not condemning, it's not pointing fingers at people. How many know Jesus does not condemn and point fingers at people? Amen? And so we have felt over the last several weeks that we've been praying that we want to, and we feel that it's necessary uh, to deal with this topic again. So we're going to do it in our men's event on November the 12th. You may be sitting in here right now and say, well, I don't have a problem with that. I don't need to be here. Yes, you do, because if you've been set free from it, you need to be here in support of others. You need to bring your faith, and we need to come together as men, and we need to be there for one another, and we need to be the best father that we can be to our children and the best husband we can be to our wife, and the best way to do that is to be free from any sexual perversion and pornography. Because it, it, it comes in to kill, steal, and destroy and to try to wreak havoc in our life. And so when you come in, no, nobody's going to have to confess, hey, I've got an addiction and everything else. That's not what this is about. But we are going to do porn and pizza since we're doing it on a Friday night. We're going to have pizza. We're going to feed you pizza. And we're going to talk about the key steps of how to really get free if you want to be free. Now, if you've got an addiction and you don't want to be free from it, I can't help you. Even the Lord can't help you. If you don't think it's a problem or an issue or a sin, hey, that's between you and the Lord. But I know that for a lot of individuals and a lot of families, they have struggled with this thing, and men have struggled with it and feel condemned by it and keep going back to it and not even meaning to. And listen, God still loves you and still has a purpose and a destiny for you, and that condemnation, God wants to lift off your life, and He wants to set you free if you want to be free in that area. Amen? It's quiet in here. 
So I need every single man under the sound of my voice to be here on November the 12th. Whether you think you've got a problem or you don't have a problem, and like I said, we're not going to put you on the spot and make you confess anything that you don't want to confess. It's not about that. We're going to give you some tools if you really want to be set free. We're going to give you some uh, practical action steps. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to lock arms together and say, you are not in this battle by yourself. That you can overcome this if you want to overcome it. And uh, so, yes, that's why y'all don't need me to do announcements. I'll talk 20 minutes on the announcements, preach the announcements and everything that. So, yes, it's called Porn and Pizza, and uh, it's going to be November the 12th at 7 o'clock. So be here, mark your calendars, go ahead, take the night off. If you had to work, just, you, you just get here, amen? Amen. Mark chapter 10, did you find it? All right, let me start my time over then. How many give me five minutes? <laughs> okay. Mark chapter 10. You know, I, I, we've been talking the last several weeks uh, about the Holy Spirit. How many has been blessed by the word that's been coming forth? Stirred in your heart about the Holy Spirit. We, we don't really, I don't really plan series out. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I've done that in the past, but I've just been in a season of my life and the ministry that God has called me to that I really haven't planned series out. Uh, of really just uh, sought the Lord, which I always seek the Lord, but really just sought the Lord and said, Lord, what are you saying to us specifically? What do we need right now? Because Jesus said, man can't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And every day, God has a word for us. Every day, God wants to speak something to us, and He wants to encourage us. And the word of God is the word that will change your life. And so we've been talking about the Holy Ghost, and uh, as, we, as we talked last week, we talked about not just being spirit-filled. A lot of people talk about being spirit-filled and praying in tongues and the controversy that comes with that. The gifts of the Spirit, are they still for today? And my pastor a long time ago told me that they weren't, and all the things. Well, Grandpa did this, and the music's supposed to be this way or not that way. And we get all, we get all caught up in, in, in a box of religion or the things that we have always just known and the things that feel comfortable, but God wants to speak to us and he wants to show us the truth of his word because when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. And so last week we talked about not just being spirit formed, I mean spirit filled, but being spirit formed where God changes us. Because when, you are, when you've got the Holy Spirit in your life, you've probably seen this somewhere on Facebook before or something. When you've got the Holy Spirit in your life, you don't just jump around, get a goose bump, and speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit will tell you to sit down and be quiet sometime. Come on now. And that's what spirit-formed is all about, being spirit-formed. If you didn't hear that message, you need to go back. Uh, we put all our mes messages on a podcast. We put them on YouTube. If you want to see a video, we record this, and we put it on YouTube. You could go back and hear that. But as I was praying this week, we're going to make a little bit of a shift because I felt in my heart that, you know what, we're living in a day and time that we all know there's been so much uncertainty, and there's been just with COVID, with the pandemic, with some people believe that it's crazy, some people believe that they're going to die. I mean, there's just everybody's on different uh, uh, levels and different perspectives of what they see and uh, what they feel and what they're going through emotionally. And it's touched uh, all of our lives and all of our families. I know people who have gotten up from it and lived from it. And I know of people that, that, that did not make it. And I don't have all the answers. And, and, and I don't know uh, all the answers. And, and I'm not saying that I know all the answers. And, you know, February will be two years ago that my mother was in the hospital on life support. And we didn't even really know what COVID was then. And, I mean, we don't have any proof that that's what she had. But, you you know, she got up. She's here today. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise. But in other cases, some people didn't get up, and I don't have any explanation for that. I don't try to explain that away or anything else, but what I know is that no matter what we believe or what we've been through, that everybody wants to be, uh, everybody wants to be uh, great in their life. They want to excel in life. And I feel like that for many of us, and even for the church, we've been in survival mode for a long time. How many just really tried to get through the next day? Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, Jesus, just take the wheel. Well, we should have been giving Jesus the wheel a long time ago. I love that thing I seen the other day. We're past the point of Jesus taking the wheel. Jesus needs to pull the car over, take off his flip-flop, and whoop some of us. You know what I'm talking about? 
That's what we need. We need a good whipping is what we need. We need to get straightened up. How many, we don't whip our children anymore because if you whip your children, then your children are going to call defects on you and everything else uh, and this kind of thing, all these crazy things that I hear. But the Bible says you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Hey, I did some stupid stuff whenever I was a kid and whenever I was a teenager. And you know what? There were some things in my heart that I hated when I got a whipping. But you know what? I'm glad I got a whipping because sometimes you need to be taken out by, behind the woodshed to have a good whipping to put you in line. And we are past the point of Jesus taking the wheel. If you haven't given the Jesus the wheel already, then we are way in trouble. We need to get back to the place of the altar and allow the Word of God to get us in the place that we need to be. But I felt as I was preparing for today, I felt that we all have, even myself, even the church, uh, we have we, we had a shutdown and then we had talks about maybe of another shutdown and we had people saying, I'll never shut down again. And we've got people on both sides of the fence. Well, you need to shut down. You don't need to shut down. You need a mask. You don't need a mask. You got to have a vaccine. You don't need to get a vaccine. We've got all this just people trying to survive and people having different opinions about things that has tried to distract us and divide us from the kingdom work that God has called us to. It, it, it's tough when you hear people say, I can't go to church because the church is too political, and I feel like that's just an excuse not to go to church. I, I, I feel like that we don't have to always agree on the same thing in, in everything, but we can still honor and respect each other's opinion, and we can walk together as God has called us to walk together, and we can walk together over unity of the Word of God. And then you have in our day and time just people trying to survive. I've been in a place that I've just tried to survive. We're just trying to make it another day and just trying to get through another day. But what God wants us to do is to get refocused, especially as the church, as his people, on kingdom business. And God still has a plan and a purpose for the church. And the plan and the purpose for the church is not brick and mortar. The church is you and I. And it's not just revive. It's every local assembly in this community. But as for me and my house, we want the fullness of the presence of the Lord. And we want to walk in the fullness of God and not just live in survival mode. Maybe we can get by, but we want to live in the abundance and the greatness that God has called us to live in. That God hadn't called a church to have to shut its doors. And if a church had to shut its doors, our hearts go out to that. And we don't mean this pridefully or anything else. But God has called every local assembly that he is called to thrive and fulfill the plan no matter what's happening in the White House, no matter what's happening with community officials, no matter what's happening around us, no matter what the news media is saying, God has a plan of greatness for His people to excel. And I want to declare over you today that if you feel like you're struggling and you just feel like you're barely getting by, if you will surrender all, like we said in the beginning, you may not always be on the mountaintop, but when you are in the valley, you will know you're coming out of this thing stronger than when you went in the valley. It doesn't mean that you might not have a bad day and depression might not try to come back into your life, and it does not mean that tragedy might not try to knock at your door, but what it means is though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know that you serve a God who will never leave you and He will never forsake you. You know that you serve a God that will make a way where there seems to be no way. That you know you serve a God that if they don't have what you need on the shelf in five months or three months or next week, you know you serve a God that will supply all of your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We are living in an hour that we must be rooted and grounded in intimacy with our Father. And knowing that His plan and His purpose has not changed. And God has given us principles in His Word. And the principles of the Word of God always bring a promise into our life. God says, if you, then I. He says, I've given you a principle. He said, I've set before you blessing and cursing, death and life. You choose. If you choose, then I. He says, if you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, test me now in this and see if I will not open up the windows for you to pour out a blessing upon you that there's not room enough to receive it. 
It's in, it's in tough times. It's in times where you just feel like you're surviving, that God wants to breathe breath and life into you to let you realize that when everything is going down, God is taking you up. That when everything seems like it's falling apart, God has a plan, a purpose, and a destiny. And if we will lock in with God, and if we will walk in His promises, and we will walk in His prim- principles, and we walk in His Word, and we are uh, uh, not just a hearer of the Word, but we actually actually do the word, God watches over his word to perform it in our life. I remember a little boy had a a, a few fishes and a few loaves, and there needed to be a miracle that took place because there were 5,000 people in Jesus' day that that, that they weren't going to be able to eat. They couldn't go to Taco Bell, and uh, my kids want to go to Taco Bell today, and they want to go to Taco Bell. They couldn't go to Taco Bell or McDonald's or anywhere else. Uh, There was nothing around, but Jesus took what a little boy had in the midst of what seemed like an impossible situation, and Jesus blessed the bread and the fish, and it multiplied. Listen, we're living in a day and time that we must realize that the God we serve is a supernatural God. And that if we, if we can't provide on our own, God will provide for us. And what we have, if we will surrender it all to Him, He will bless it and multiply it. He is good that way. He is good that way. And there's this thing of greatness that a lot of people had dreams before even this pandemic. A lot of people thought things that were, things were going to happen. And, and, and even for the church many times when God has called us to reach a community. And, and, and I see a day where we have a piece of land where we can, uh, we can have fellowship on the ground. Where we can have picnic on the ground. Where we can have youth events and we can have community events on the ground. That we have a place that we can gather. And if we want to pop up a tent and have a revival under the tent, we can pop up a tent and uh, not just have a revi- revival is more than a tent meeting, but you hear what I'm saying, that, that, that we can move forward with the school that God has called us to and the, and the van that God wants to give us and all the, things that, all the things that we've had, but sometimes we just go back into a survival mode, even corporately, but we often do that personally as well. And we tend to draw back. We tend to draw back when God is wanting us to move forward. Somebody shout forward. And God wants to do great things and he wants us to excel. And I don't know anybody that's never wanted to do great things. I mean, I know people that want to stay behind the scene. That's where I was. I didn't want to be in, out in the front and all this kind of stuff and, you know, wanted to stay behind the scenes. But you can be behind the scenes and still be doing great things for God. You know, we we talked about it last week. We all get caught up in this thing of success. Success is what many people can see. Oh, that person's successful. Look what they drive. Look where they live. Look at their education. Look what they wear. Yada, yada, on and on and on. And success is really all about us. But significance is about others. And there's some of us that think we're not successful because we're not where we thought we should be and what was in our five-year plan and everything else. But if you are walking with God, you are making a significance. And you, when you are making a significance and you are being significant in the eyes of God, it does not matter your job title or where you're at. You are being significant and fulfilling what God has called you to fulfill. But a lot of times we see success through my title. We see success through uh, what clock I punch and all these kind of things. But God is in not just to our own success, but He is into us being significant. He is into us being great. And we all want to be, be, be great, but the way we go about being great is very important in our life. We all want to do great things. And there's a world's way of doing great things, and there is a kingdom way of doing great things. We are living in a day and time that I believe with all of my heart is the greatest opportunity and the hour for the church. And all I hear a lot of times is, man, our attendance is down. And I'm not talking about here. We have attendance like this here too. Sometimes people come when they feel like it and when they don't feel like it and yada, yada, yada. And if you don't feel good, you need to stay home and you need to take a vacation sometimes and you need to get away. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not saying you have to be here every time the doors are open. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that we live in a day and time when you look in the natural, it looks like if you look in the natural, the church could decline and you hear all these statistics of how many churches had to shut their doors during COVID and all these kind of things. And a lot of times that's all we focus on and see. But I'm here to 
to tell you what we don't see are the eternal things that are happening. And God is calling forth a bride. He's calling forth a people. And God is calling. And just like Gracie heard a call, she answered the call and the tug. And there's so many that don't answer the call and the tug. They continue to ignore it and continue to live their own life. But God is raising up a great church in this hour. And I believe with all of my heart that no matter what we're seeing in the natural, that now is the greatest hour for the church to see Jesus do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think or imagine. But it comes back to this simple thing. Many times in life we think, well, I can't preach and I can't pray and I don't have a gift and I can't do this and I can't do that. But when the church gets back to the original intent that Jesus has for us to walk in greatness and to see his kingdom come, that's when things begin to shift and change in our life. And the world has a way of being great and the kingdom has a way. And the bad thing is, is a lot of times in the church, we don't understand the kingdom way. We understand rules. We understand religion. But we don't understand the kingdom ways. Because kingdom ways are kingdom of principles. It's God's word in our life. And when we apply them to our life, they change our life forever. How do we really live as Christians? The way we were brought up? What we saw? What we know? What society says is acceptable? You know, in our day and time, there's a lot of pressure, and that pressure may even increase on the American church. There's a lot of pressure to be politically correct, and you can't say certain things because if you do, they might take your 501c3 and your tax exemption and all these kind of things. And I don't say that boastfully or pridefully. These are serious things that we see that try to threaten the church, even in America today. These are things that we hear, whether those things ever come to pass or not. I'm not the one to say whether they will or not, but if they do, we even see it today that a, 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 a lot of times with the upheaval and this thing about race and all these kind of things, that is, is just trying to cause a division even within the body of Christ that a lot of times even the church and even pastors and prophets and evangelists and teachers will become conformed to the world and not speak the truth because we have to be politically correct and I can't offend anybody because if I offend somebody, not that we want to offend anybody on purpose, but if I speak the truth and it offends somebody, then my church won't grow and maybe my offering won't be as big. So we have to we have to scale back and we have to throttle back many times uh, to, to, to be politically correct, but not in this house in the name of Jesus. Because I don't say that pridefully, but only the truth will set us free. And when I stand before the Lord, when I take my last breath, He's not going to say, how big was your church and how many followers did you have? He's going to say, son, did you do what I called you to do? Did you speak what I called you to speak? Did you say what I called you to say? Because the the only thing that sets communities free, that, that, that sets captives free, is the truth of the gospel. And we live in a society today where that's old-fashioned, and you, 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 that's a bunch of rules, and that's a bunch of religion and everything else, and we wonder why our families are in chaos. We wonder why our marriages are in chaos. We wonder why our communities are in chaos. We wonder why people shoot people up and all this kind of thing. It's because there is an order that is out of order, and when we get into the order of the Lord, when order is there, the glory of God follows the order as we submit to the Word and the will of God in our lives. And it's so important in our day. And we live in a society that, 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 that Christianity is how we were brought up and the way we see it and what society says is acceptable. But there is a kingdom principle and there is a kingdom way of doing things that, 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 that whenever you walk in those kingdom principles, the benefits of God's way of doing things flows in your life. And this thing of greatness and excelling boils all the way back down to are we willing to surrender and are we willing to serve? You know, you can have the greatest prayer meeting, but if you're not a servant, you can pray eloquent prayers, you can preach great sermons, but if you don't have the love in your heart to serve, you're a clanging symbol. And servanthood is so important that in Mark chapter 10, I'm actually 
I know I gave you guys verse 43, but I'm going to back up to verse 35. It says this, Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, speaking to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. I just chuckle when I read that. I've read that before, but I just chuckle because I think of my kids. You know, they come to me when I'm trying to watch the football game. They're like, Daddy, just say yes, just say yes. I said, I am not saying yes. I have no idea what you're about to ask me. I am not saying yes. Daddy, just say yes, just say yes. They don't do that all the time, but they've done that before. Daddy, just say yes. And here, here's the disciples of Jesus. They said, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. <laughs> we know, Jesus, that you can do anything. We've seen your miracles and everything else. We just want you to do what we ask you to do. A little bit selfish sometimes, don't you think? Verse 36, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? This is just the goodness of God. I didn't even ask my kids. I just said no. <laughs> Before I say yes, no. <laughs> Dad, just say yes, no. Before they can even say get yes out of their mouth, I'm like, no. Oh, Dad, you didn't even let me ask you. Will you ask me to say yes before you even ask me what you wanted me to say yes to? No. But Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus was put a little bait out there. He wants to say, all right, what, what's really in your heart? Because I think even Pastor Drew said it this morning, or maybe it was Pastor Drew. I don't know who said it. Maybe I, somebody said it. He don't want your money. He don't want your stuff. He don't, he don't want what you consider your freedoms. He just wants your heart. And I believe Jesus asked, asked this question because he wanted to see what was in the heart of his disciples. And you know what? When he found out what was in the heart of his disciples, he didn't, he didn't kick them and abandon them. He told them the truth, and as he told them the truth, he instructed them in the way. And a lot of times in our society today, most people don't want to come to church because they think it's a bunch of religious rules. And if you don't live up to the religious rules, then they're going to they're gonna cast you out, and they're going to ban you from coming in and everything else. But Jesus said, no, all you who are weary and heavy, heavy burdensome, come to me. All you, all you prostitutes, come to me. All you sinners, come to me. Come unto me, and I'm going to give you this thing called called rest. And that rest is more than just a ticket to heaven. It is heaven on earth. <laughs> you know, growing up, I always thought that if you go to church and if you did, did, did the rules, then one day you might get to heaven. I didn't realize that whenever you go to church, you don't just go to church to go to church, that God's church is a place that you grow in Him one of the places that you can grow in Him. But when I went to church and got saved, and then I began to realize that, 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 that God doesn't just want me to get, get to heaven. God wants to get heaven in me so I can release heaven into the earth. And, and, and I didn't realize that, that you know what, with all my mess-ups, all my hang-ups, all my hiccups, all my disappointments, and all these kind of things, that God was going to clean me up. That didn't make him nervous about anything. He was going to change my heart because the plan and the purpose and the good things that he had for me wasn't based on what I did or did not do. It was based on what he already did by shedding his blood, and he wasn't just trying to get me a ticket so that I could be to heaven one day. No, he wanted a relationship with me. He didn't want me to just visit visit him on a Sunday on occasion or a Wednesday every now and then. No, he wanted to be a part of my everyday life because he was trying to get something to me every day. Every day I'm with my wife so I can get a kiss. No, not just so I can get a kiss, but when I'm with my wife, I can get a kiss. Kisses are nice from your wife. All right, let me move on. I don't want just a kiss on Sunday. Sometimes after a Monday coming home in the evening, I need a kiss. I just need your arms around me to tell you, you know what? It's going to be all right. We're going to make it through this. We're going to get through this. I am the worst about reading the scripture and not finishing it. And saying everything else that don't even pertain to it. And he said to them, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us that we may sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to, him, to them, you do not even know what you ask. 
Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and the baptism I am baptized with. You will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those from whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. The other ten were like, what are y'all doing? But Jesus called them to himself and said to to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones... And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great, whoever desires to excel, whoever desires to be great in my kingdom, in my house, in my, in my family. He says, whoever de- desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Somebody shout servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. We have lost this thing of servanthood because even in our society today, we just want to be served. And if you don't serve me just like I think you need to serve me, what happens? We get upset with people. We get mad at people. We, we, don't, we don't give grace to people and all these kind of things. And Jesus was the example that we are to follow and listen. Jesus said that I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. We're talking about the son of the living God. We're talking about the man who was God but came to the earth, was tempted with every temptation that we're tempted with, But he did not give in to those temptations because of the power that he was yielded to, the Holy Spirit in his life, and the grace of his Father. We're talking about the man that had to go through the same uh, stress and anxiety that we may be going through today. We're talking about Jesus who absolutely transformed cities and restored lives. And it's because he was a servant of his Father. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. And if you're going to only do what you see your father do, you must be in the presence of your father. He said, I only say what I hear my father say. And if we're going to only say, and Jesus only said what he heard his father say, he had to be in the presence of his father. He served him. He served his father in the secret place and in the quiet place. He served his father in the synagogue way before he ever started his ministry that for years he was a carpenter and he was showing up at the synagogue. And and, and, and at 33, he began his ministry. But you know what? He said, I only do what I see my father do and I only say what I hear my father say. Jesus came to serve the will of his father. And in our society today, we serve our own, we, we serve our own self. We serve our, uh, many times, at the expense of our, our, our spiritual walk. We, we, we serve even at, uh, ourself at the expense of others. But Jesus absolutely transformed cities and changed lives. And Jesus said in, uh, I think it's John 14, the works that I do, you shall do. We should be doing the works that Jesus did. And the way Jesus began his works was by coming and serving. He came and he served his father. He served the communities that he came into. He came with a humble heart and a humble spirit. He came with not saying he knew everything and had everything and he's got every word and he prayed the best prayers and all this kind of thing. No, he came to serve. There's something about serving that causes greatness in your life. There's something that causes the grace to flow in your life when you give. That's why, that's not the only reason, but we go into the community. And that's why we're putting boxes together for Thanksgiving. And we're going to people that may never come to this church. That we're not going to their door just to try to get them to come to church. If they don't have a church, yes, we welcome them and we want them here. But we're going to serve them and we're going to take a, we're going to 
to take a meal to them that maybe they wouldn't have got any other way, and we're going to serve them as we serve the Lord, and we're going to give them the greatest thing, better than a box of macaroni and cheese. We're going to give them the gospel of love of Jesus Christ, and we're going to see God transform and change people's lives on their doorstep, and whether they come to the church or not, that is between them and the Lord, but that is serving in an unselfish way, serving our Father who is in heaven. I don't see why anybody wouldn't want to be a part of that. When we go into the community and we, 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 we pray in our community and we worship in our community, it's serving, it's giving our time to come. Well, I don't think I'll get anything out of it. Well, maybe it's not for you to get anything out of. Maybe God has put something in you so that you can bring it that somebody else might get something out of it. Maybe just your obedience to say, hey, I'm going to serve, and maybe nobody will even know that I'm there, and I might not even get to lead somebody in a prayer or anything else. Maybe just your presence being there and mumbling a prayer under your voice opens up a door for somebody else to get saved. Well, nobody will notice me and nobody will this and that. That's when we got the wrong heart and the wrong attitude. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And our society likes to be served. We expect to be served. And if we're not served the way we think we should, we get an attitude. How many get an attitude? We all get attitude sometimes. Listen, some people can't serve others anymore because they've been hurt. I've seen people get upset with children in children's ministry and said, man, them children are unruly. I ain't doing this no more. Yes, children are unruly, and they need somebody in their life to come alongside their parents because it's the parent's job to disciple them and train them. But God gives pastors and teachers and youth pastors to help come alongside to instill and to impart the word of the living God in their life. But some people get so upset with the church because they don't put, they, their, their service is too long. So, Lord, I can't go there. Or, you know, the music is too loud. Lord, I can't go there. And if God is calling you to go somewhere, that's where you need to be, and that's where you need to be serving because that's going to be your greatest hour and your greatest opportunity. But some people can't serve because they've been hurt. Some people can't serve because they feel more important. You remember that? Been there, done that. I wasn't there sure about that. Been there and done that. Usually it's a testimony of our stupidity. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Whew, been there and done that, buddy. I'll be praying for you. You know what I mean? But you also have this attitude sometimes in the church, man. I've been there and done that. I ain't ushering. I ain't opening a door. Clean a toilet. Empty a trash. Make some coffee for somebody. I ain't doing that, Pastor. I'm a seasoned saint. I got the word of the Lord. Well, if you're not willing to serve, it does not matter the word you've got because if your heart and your motive is not right, then and that's a whole nother sermon. But you know what? It's this, this, this heart that Jesus had that I'm just here to serve. I'm just here to serve whatever that looks like. And some people feel that they're more important than others. And when we feel that way, you never reach the level in the kingdom that God is calling you to. Because wherever you stop serving, that's where you stop growing. That's where you stop growing. And listen, life can be tough sometimes. And I realize that there, we tell people whenever they come in here many times, listen, you don't have to get right on a team ministry. You might have been wore out from your other church. I say this a lot of times. I say a lot of times, especially the church that I got saved in, I'm so grateful for it. It's a church in this community. I, I drive by it every single day. I drive by it every single day. And I, I thank God that God move and bless that congregation. But you know what? When you signed up for anything to serve in, you signed up until you died. That's why we have organ players that are like 90 years old. God bless them. You know what I mean? In some churches, I'm not making fun of that. They are faithful. They are there. They've been there since they were born again when they were eight years old and got baptized when they were knee high to a grasshopper. Man, they've been there since the beginning. They're Paul Paul's, Paul Paul's, Paul Paul. Laid the first brick in the walkway and everything else. But you know what? Sometimes you need a week off. Sometimes you might need a Sunday off. Sometimes you might need to go on a vacation. Sometimes you might need to say, hey, I just need a few weeks off, and that's okay, but don't abandon the whole ship. But life does get tough sometimes. We get 
depressed, heartaches, hurts. And when we face these things, we often forget to serve. And a lot of times when we forget to serve, we're focusing on ourselves. And I believe in self-care. I believe in taking care of yourself, but not at the expense of hearing and fulfilling and following the heart of the principle of the Lord to serve. Not only ourselves, but others. The Bible says, whatever a man sows, that he will reap. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. Some people say, I am too hurt to serve. But if you will sow healing, healing will come to your heart. People, I, I, I can say this because I've been there before. When you are depressed, sow joy into someone else's life. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you know misery loves misery. You know when you're on break at work and, oh, God, here comes misery. You know what I mean? Everything's bad, and my wife didn't do this, and my dog didn't do that, and my gosh, my paycheck wasn't what it was supposed to be, and they messed it up, and I'm going to go in there and tell somebody and give somebody a number or two, or, you know, on and on and on. Here comes misery, and sometimes you want to say, just shut up, you know? Is that okay to say in church? Just shut up. Misery coming down the aisle. So, you know what I found out? Misery loves company. So, usually when people are miser when people are miserable, they want to make everybody else miserable. If you are miserable, sow some joy into somebody else's life and see if something don't break on the inside of you. I know that sounds funny and, you know, what do you mean something break on the inside of me? I'm talking about that thing that just feels like it's got you gripped where all you see is, is that dark cloud over your life. You know how to get that dark cloud off of your head? Begin to sow joy in someone else's life. Send somebody a text message that is not cussing them out but tell them, you know what? I just believe something good about you. Just say something good. Buy somebody else's lunch, even if you feel like you don't have the money to do it. Just do something out of the ordinary, and when you do that and you serve someone, it breaks something off of your heart. Even Jesus came and washed his disciples' feet. For a lot of people, uh, we've had this uh, conversation in staff meeting maybe a few times. Y'all better not wash our feet. <laughs> you know, you better not wash our feet. And I'm like the same way. You better not wash my feet. <laughs> like, leave my feet alone. But you know what? Jesus even gave that as an example. And Jesus should have been having his feet washed. But he took the towel. The Bible says he put the towel around him and he went. We need a towel ministry. Come on somebody. It's a ministry of serving. It is serving because listen, if we don't serve our community whether they believe what we believe or not, if we don't serve our neighbors whether they like what we like or not, and we say, well, we can't serve that person, man. They smoke dope. We can't serve that person. They drink alcohol. We can't serve that person. They smoke a cigarette. We can't serve that po person. They do this. They do that. We can't serve that person. Well, serving them and loving them instead of being so spiritually above everybody else may show them that Jesus is the real love that even a prostitute came to Jesus and everybody of his disciples wanted to throw a stone at her and he looked at them and said, you who are without sin cast the first stone. Wow, Jesus could have dropped the mic right there because nobody can. And a lot of times we're trying to look at the splinter in our brother's eye when we got a big old plank in our own eye. But what the church needs to get back to is serving Jesus and loving him and loving people whether they're red, yellow, black and white, gay, straight, whatever. We just love people. We don't compromise the word or the gospel and we still speak the truth in love, but we serve them. And it breaks things. It'll break things off this community. It'll break things off your family. You know the family member that you can't stand no more? You just serve them. The last thing we want to do, whatever a man sows, he reaps. Jesus has some days that he could have gotten down. He could have, he could have had a lot of things that had gotten him depressed about when he told his disciples to pray with him for an hour, and he came back, and they were snoring. <laughs> he said, can you not tarry with me for one hour? All I ask is for you to pray, and you are asleep. One of his 12 coming to him and betraying him. He could have said, I am done with this. I am 
done with serving. He could have went to his father and said, I'm done, of, I'm done serving these nuts and these flakes and these fruit loops. I am done with it. If you're not a pastor, you, I can feel that sometimes with a pastor. I'm like, man, they some nuts. And there are people looking at me like he's a fruit too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jesus had some days through the process. Jesus kept going. He kept serving. Even when one of his disciples betrayed him, he kept going. He kept serving. See, the world measures your greatness and your success by how much money you make, what kind of car you drive, how big your house is. But God measures greatness. God measures greatness by how well we serve others. And we were created to serve each other. I've said this from the beginning, that God called me to pastor, and we started this church eight years ago. I, people are not called to serve me. People are called to serve alongside me because people are not here to serve me as the pastor. Yes, you honor your pastor. You respect your pastor. When your pastor says come to church, you come to church. When your pastor says come to prayer, you come to prayer if you can. You know, you honor, you respect, you do everything that you can, and, 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 and but the, the man of God. We all are men and women of God. It is not called to carry my to carry my Bible or carry my iPad or anything else. That's all okay and fine. But listen, I'm not here for people to serve me. I'm here for people to serve Jesus, to serve each other, and to serve this community because when we get that servant's heart, the glory of God comes. I gotta hurry up. Y'all gave me 510. Y'all gave me 65, but I can't got time to read that scripture. But every person is valuable. Every person is valuable in the sight of the Lord. Every person is important. And can I tell you this? Every person is a piece to God's puzzle. If you're not serving God, you are not only hurting yourself, you are hurting others. There is a weightiness to this thing that people in our society today, we forget about. Because it becomes all about us. It becomes all about what makes us comfortable and what we feel good about. But you are a part of God's puzzle. And God is trying to put this thing together by leading us by His Spirit. And when you don't function in your role, you're not only hurting yourself, but you are hurting others. Serving is not just for blessing you, it is for blessing others. There are times that we serve that we don't feel like we get anything out of it. I learned that. That was drilled into me at ministry school. They put me in the nursery with two-year-olds. And I said, I am not, I, I didn't tell them this, but I'm thinking, I am not called to two-year-olds. Like, why are y'all putting me in here for a whole month? Like the church had two services. We had to go to the 9 o'clock service, and the 11 o'clock service was always running over. So the 11 o'clock service, we had to, we had to be uh, serving these little two-year-olds. And I'm thinking, I th don't they know I'm called to pastor? I should be in the study with the pastor so I can see how he gets ready and how he prays and how he prepares Little did I know Jesus was putting me with the two-year-olds to train me and to teach me something. And it wasn't for me at the time. It was to help the people out that run the children's ministry. Because can I tell you something? Hey! Every area, help! <laughs> Everybody doing their part. Because serving's not just about you, it's about these babies, it's about these youth. Serving's about the next generation. Serving's not about my bank account. It's not about how big my ministry is or how big my ministry could go if I could just get somebody else to serve. It's about leaving a legacy for those that are coming up behind us and our children, teaching them the way that the way of God is to serve and to give and to sow. Bible says, whatever man sows, that he will also reap. And when you don't function in your role, 
You not only hurt yourself, but you hurt others because serving's not always about me, it's about others. I've had people say, well, man, they're doing these growth groups on Wednesday nights. I, I already been through that. I already know about that. Well, maybe you're there to help somebody else. We've got to shift our mindset from ourselves to others. It's important. Jesus was all about teams. And when you don't serve and you use your gifts and talents, you are selfish. There is a season that you have to see it. That's okay. Don't hear me wrong. There is a time that the Lord says, hey, you see it. There, there's, I know there's a Martha and there's a Mary and there's a balance. And I understand all that. But when God is calling you and tugging on your heart and you don't use your gifts and your talents, you are selfish. When you sit on your gifts, you know what you do? You bury your talents. There's a whole parable about that that I don't have time today to talk about. When you don't serve your spouse, when you don't serve your family, when you don't serve your neighbors, when you don't serve your church, when you don't serve the body of Christ, we become selfish. And you know why people get burned out in church? Because 20% are doing 80% of the work. There's this 20-80 principle, and sometimes that's not always right, but it's usually the faithful few over and over and over again because people sit on their gifts or their talents, and sometimes it's not only about, well, I don't got a gift, and I don't got a talent. And I said this a few weeks ago. God is looking for two abilities. That is availability and teachability. And if you are available and you are teachable, God will take you places your education couldn't take you, your neighbor couldn't take you, your job job can't take you. Your boss can't take you. Your own ability can't take you. God is just looking for some available and some teachable people so that he can pour out his presence and his spirit and see an entire community change. And when we serve, we reap the benefits in our own marriage, in our own family, and even in our own children. What is our excuse? I, 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 oh, gosh. Some people's like, man, he's manifesting something right now. Maybe something's coming out. Maybe I'm getting free of something. I don't know. But, but I could make a list of the excuses. I, I, sometimes I've, I haven't told anybody this, but I sit in my office sometimes after a time of prayer, or maybe not after a time of prayer, before the time of prayer, and I'm like, man, I could do a, co- 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 a stand-up comedian act on the excuses people give why they can't serve God, why they can't come to church, why they can't do what God is called them to do the excuses sometimes I'm like wow you really did that you really said that and then I begin to look at myself and say oh I did that before too (laughs) I remember being in that place in my life but you know what a lot of times people get burned out because the body is not functioning the way it's created to function every person is important that's the motto man that is the that is the kingdom way of doing things that it's Every member of the body is a minister. (laughs) Every member is a minister if we would begin to realize that and understand that. And listen, serving begins in your home. Serving begins, husbands, with your wife. Serving your wife and serving your children. Wives, serving begins with your husband and your children. You know what? we got to be the greatest servants that we can be in the home. But sometimes we use the home as an excuse not to serve the house of the Lord. We're to serve each other, and we are to serve our families, and we are to serve our community, but we are to serve our Father. And sometimes I look and I say, man, church declined, the attendance of church has declined, and everybody wants to argue, I ain't got to go to church to be a Christian, and no, you don't. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, and you don't have to go to church to love God, and you ain't got to be at church every time the doors open and everything else. But you, but, but, but when you begin to realize that you have something for the body, yes, you need to be blessing people in Walmart and blessing people in the dollar store. But you know what? There is something about serving the Father's house because when people drive by and people see a place and they begin to be drawn by the Spirit of God and people come in to a place that's serving one another and even the person that comes off the street we begin to serve it's the house of the lord serving in the house of the lord is so important in our life people get burned out there's been some abusive situations and people want to be served instead of served we want to protect people from burnout it's not about burning people out What are we doing with our gifts? What are we doing with our talents? 
What are we doing with what God has called us to do? What are we doing with our time and our resources? Are we really serving our family or are we serving our own purpose? And I realize that sometimes as the man of the house, you got to work, you got to make ends meet, but man, not at the expense of your family, not at the expense of your marriage. God will make a way. Are we serving what, what, our time, our resources, our family? God's house, each other, because we will give an account to the Lord. It's so sobering, church. We will give an account to the Lord for what he's entrusted with us. That's the whole parable of the talents. It's more than money. It's more than stuff. It's more than things. And God has called us to be a great church. And a great church is a church that serves with all of their heart, all of their soul, and all of their strength. Won't you stand to your feet?